be it's worth spending uh, 45 minutes to an hour on this um, because it is an important subject might not be your favorite one yet <laughs> but it's definitely um, important so what I thought I'd do there's so much I can talk about um, but I think to make it most helpful I just thought I'd talk about all the essentials that you need to know this presentation is quite heavy um, but I thought I'm only going to do this I, well I'd love to do it again but um, for the near future we may only be uh, virtually seeing each other once um, so we just want to give you everything you need to know um, in summary form. Please don't worry, I can send you the presentation if you really want it. Um, so you don't have to like take photos and screenshots and, and things like that. I will just send, I promise you, I'll send it to you as it is if you just drop me an email um, at the end. So it's quite a lot of information, just try and take in as much as you can. So what we're going to do is go through the patient's whole journey. Um, we're going to start off um, essentially your patients in the chair. We're going to take them through their treatment journey and then we're going to finish up. The only biology I'm going to go through is now, um, which is just I want to remind you of the etiology of perio, because things have changed a little bit. Um, you know that they're obviously inflammatory conditions, and by the way, that's why they're linked with general health conditions, because things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, they're all inflammatory. That's where the link is, um, so it's good to know that. But the kind of key buzzword now in perio is Clark is like old school. Um, it's all about biofilms. So that's the word we use now, and it's the formation and persistence of microbial biofilms that uh, essentially causes either gingivitis, which is reversible, or periodontitis, which is irreversible. But the key thing is this balance, the balance between the host and the microbial um, uh, my microbiome, basically. And it's when that balance is not quite balanced, you get disease. Now, an interesting statistic is that 80% of the tissue damage that happens is actually because of the host response, not because of the bacteria, but because of host response. Now just think about that for a second. We always go on banging on about the bacteria, but it's not just the bacteria. In fact, a lot of it is to do with the body. And that's why I always say to my patients, perio is a really unfair condition, right? Some people don't even brush their teeth and they're fine. And some people really look after their teeth and they still have really severe disease. It's all about the host and genetics and the way the host is modified either by local or systemic factors. So that's the only biology I want to go through just to keep at the back of your mind. So let's go straight on to, um, let's dream her back onto the clinic. I'm sure you're really missing it. Um, but imagine you've got Mark here, um, Mark Smith, Mr. Smith, your, your next patient who's sitting in the chair. Now, obviously the first thing we do is our history taking. Um, now I know there's quite a large group, but I would like to make the most of the chat guys. So, um, we will have questions at the end, but let's try and make it a little bit more interactive so you don't fall asleep. So Mark's in your chair, okay? I know he doesn't look like he's got perio, um, but in the group chat, if you can let me know what kind of questions might you ask him that will provoke or give you an idea that he might be a perio patient. What kind of things might he say that you might think, oh, uh, uh, Miss Smith's a perio patient? Any offers? Excellent. So first one is the most important one. Have you experiencing bleeding? Um, Owen has actually um, added on saying, what about when you're brushing? So that's a perfect answer. So bleeding when you're brushing, okay, is a key thing. Um, mobility, very good, bad breath. Wow, you guys are on fire, you've got it all. Okay, so um, I know it says seven, but I've edited it down to four because I wanted to keep it a summary. But these four questions, pretty much what you said actually, um, you must include this in your history taking. Now, the reason what, when you get to practice, you might see patients who have already been in the practice before, but when you're on clinic uh, in the hospital, I would ask every question, every um, patient, these four very quick questions. Number one, do your gums bleed on brushing? Always add on brushing. Because if you say to them, do your gums bleed? They'll be like, no, of course they don't. And they're like, sure they don't bleed. They'll only bleed when I brush. And they make it out as like a normal thing that your, your gums bleed when, when, they, when you brush them, which is not normal, right? So always ask, do your um, gums bleed when you're, when you're brushing? Do you have any loose teeth? Mobility is a really key sign of perio. And um, instead of bad breath, actually, I would probably add on to that or instead say bad taste because it's quite embarrassing to admit to bad breath, right? So your patient might be like, nah, I don't get bad breath, but they might say, I get a bit of bad taste. That's a good one to ask. And any gum swellings um, or gum boils is a good one. So you're in the chair, ask those four questions. The reason why I say ask them is if you don't, you'll find with perio patients, they won't give you a history of presenting complaint. They'll just say, yeah, I'm fine, I don't have any issues. Then you put the chair back, you have a look in the mouth, there's like grade three mobile teeth everywhere with grade two furcation involvements. 
and like, Mr. Smith, are you sure you're not getting any like problems biting down that side or looseness? Like, oh yeah, I guess I get a bit of looseness. And then you're kind of doing your complaining of at the end of your appointment, which is not good because that doesn't provide any value to what you're doing. So get in the habit of asking very quick questions to all your patients, even if they don't say that they're having any issues because you might be surprised. The next thing you do is obviously your history taking, and this is where you're going to pick up your risk factors. So diabetes is obviously your biggest medical risk factor. So you look at your medical history form and they've ticked style, you've gone through it and they've said, okay, I'm diabetic. What's the next, let's go back to the chat. What's the next question you're going to ask your patient about their diabetes? They said they're diabetic. What's now relevant? What, what, what details do you now want? Any others? Very good. How well controlled is it? Does anyone know how you measure that? What's the best way, most accurate way of measuring control? Very good. HbA1c. And does anyone know what number that might be if it's well controlled? I can see you all being reminded. 58 nearly is a bit lower than that, but I'm impressed you've got the units almost correct. Any other offers? Okay, very good, really, really good. So with diabetes, okay, we'll come back to these. It's all about control. Um, you know what diabetes is, everyone knows what diabetes is. It's becoming a uh, very, very, um, like perio, it's, it's on the increase. Um, we call it a modifiable risk factor, by the way, because although you can't cure it, you can control it. So the first thing, as you said, is you need to know about their control. Um, and if they're well controlled, their risk is actually the same as a healthy individual. That's how much control, how important control is. To get their control, firstly, you also need to know what type they are, type one or type two. Then you get their control. The HbA1c should be 48 or 50 millimoles per mole or less. Um, it used to be in a percentage. When I learned at university, it was a percentage like 6.5, 7%, but now they've changed the units to millimoles per mole. But when you're dealing with these patients, some of the things to remember, okay, they're going to be at risk of hypo. So you might want, if you're doing half mouth, you might want to see them at the beginning of the day after breakfast or after lunch. Um, check their glycemic control. Um, they are, uh, if, especially if they're uncontrolled, they are at risk of more uh, having more perio. Um, so you might want to see them more frequently. Um, they need to know if their perio is not well controlled that your treatment's not going to work as well. Now that doesn't mean you're going to say, sorry, Mr. Smith, I'm not treating you. What you're going to say is, Mr. Smith, we really need to work on your diabetes. In fact, it needs to be part of your treatment plan, right? So you know when you do one, OHI, two, da, 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 it needs to be one discussion of the importance of diabetes control it should be part of your treatment plan. Um, and if it's not well controlled, they need to know that it's, you're, you're gonna do the treatment, but it's not gonna work as well. Be a supporter for these patients. There is so much on their mind. And I'm sure you know at least about one person with diabetes, they have to think about so much. Can I eat this? Can I have that? Um, have I been to my um, diabetic foot ulcer appointment? Have I been to my eye appointment? You know. Uh, it's just there's so much to think about. And if you start going on about using their interdental brushes and telling them off that they're not using them, they're, they're really going to lose interest. It's better to say something like, you know, Smith, I know you're really busy. You've got so much to think about with your general health. Where can we fit in these interdental brushes? Even if you just use them to start off with once every other day, where can we work with you to make this happen? Um, by the way, it's also going to improve your diabetes as well. Um, so you try and work with them. On that point, um, a really, really interesting stat, which you might know, if you do some good gum treatment, you can actually improve this HbA1c by 0.4%. This doesn't sound like much, but have a look at the stats. Even a 1% reduction is gonna reduce diabetes deaths by 21%. Now, a better way to explain this to your patient is to say to them, Mr. Smith, um, just to let you know, um, if we can really get your gums under control, do some good gum disease treatment, um, do you do know that it's actually we can improve your diabetes control equivalent to you know your gp adding a diabetes drug in your regime it's a bit like saying say that the gp was thinking oh i might need to give him some metformin if you can get the gums under control you might actually not need that metformin and there's so many more advantages of doing peri treatment than having drugs so this impact is huge um this kind of stuff is really going to motivate your patients so you must bring it into your conversations other medical things that we might see um, uh, when we're doing our medical um, history taking, necrotizing um, periodontal diseases related to AIDS, any immunodeficiency, look out for this. This is your kind of textbook picture. It's not gonna look like this um, because the drugs are so well controlled now. So you need to be even more vigilant. 
you know, look out for the pseudomembrane, look out for the punch out for look out for the halitosis. Um, it may not be as obvious, but that's in your medical history. Pregnancy as well, in, in part of your medical history. And pregnancy is a really important one to um, talk to your patient about because they get really worried about having treatment when they're pregnant. Um, what happens, I guess, you get hormonal changes. The gums, what I say to my patients is they get more sensitive. So now even a little bit of bacteria is gonna have an exaggerated response. And that exaggerated response may be edematous or it may be proliferative. And edematous is like you're probing and it's just profusely bleeding. Um, and proliferative is your classic pregnancy epidus. Um, these are really good guidelines um, to look at. They're on the EFP website and they're free to um, download. There's so many resources, not just on the BSP, but on the EFP. European Federation of Perio um, websites. So I definitely check uh, those out. Finally, on your medical history, you have medications. Now, which medications am I talking about here? Any guesses? <coughs> what can do this to your gums? Which the three particular ones you, um, that should come to mind? Perfect. There's one more that I'm looking for. Yeah, perfect. So, great. So you've got, um, and by the way, what is this called? Obviously it's called drug influence gingival enlargement. It's no longer called, by the way, and uh, the new classification, they've changed so many things. Um, it's not long, no longer called um, drug, uh, gingival overgrowth. It's not called hyperplasia or all those other old terms that we used to use. It's now um, called enlargement. So that's a lot, uh, proper word to use, drug influence gingival enlargement. So the medications that you've said are the culprits. Um, classically, this actually begins in the interdental area. Um, and before I did my specialist training, I don't think I noticed this enough. And now, even when I see patients on amlodipine, which is a quite a common drug, when it hits over five milligrams, you tend to, on a lot of patients, see this very fibrous change in the papilla. And that's the time you really need to hone down on the oral hygiene and say, look, you really need to be good at oral hygiene, otherwise this is gonna get much worse. So um, be really vigilant with this as well. It might not be as obvious as it is on this um, slide. This is a problem. Um, there's a bit of a vicious cycle here, right? You, you're never gonna get an incidental uh, TP brush through that. If you can't get a TP brush through there, there's gonna be more plaque. If there's more plaque, it's gonna overgrow. It's gonna overgrow, it's gonna be harder to clean. You're gonna be even harder to, um, it's just gonna go round, round, round. You wanna try and prevent it from getting to this stage. Um, this would need surgery for sure to get it under control. So that's your medical history. Then you go on to your family history where we talk about genetics. And I kind of alluded to it at the beginning, but 50% actually of the reason why someone has perio is due to host genetic factors. So it's not just for what we used to call aggressive perio, it's actually for any type of perio. Um, the only thing I would bear in mind is I would take family history of perio with a little bit of, uh, a little pinch of salt. Because if someone says to you, um, you know, my mom, she's 80, she lost all her teeth um, and she's, you know, um, I, I, I think I've just got weak gums and weak teeth. It's probably not a positive family history. Um, whereas if someone says to you, you know what, my sibling who's 35 is having treatment in the hospital as well. They've had some surgery um, and all this other stuff, no other risk factors. Like, oh, okay, that's a positive family history. So just take it with a, with a pinch of salt, but it is important. In the social history, you have your smoking is obviously your, like diabetes is the biggest one for medical. Smoking is the biggest one for social history. And um, there are less people smoking, but it's still a, a huge number. And smoking is really bad all around for perio. Um, it's gonna increase your susceptibility. You're gonna get deeper pockets. So it's gonna be more severe. Um, you're not gonna get good, imp good improvements with treatment. And even if you do, it's gonna reoccur. So smoking cessation is one of the biggest things we must do for all our patients. And you can use the five A's or you can use AAR, so ask, advise, refer but definitely guide them to smoking cessation clinics. Um, any kind of professional help that will triple their chance of quitting, another stat to use. These kind of stats are really good to kind of memorize because patients really like it when you, um, it's, it's great for communication. So using these services triples their odds of quitting. So you've got a patient who says, oh, I don't know if I want, I want to stop, but I just want to try myself. Just say, look, I don't know if you know this, but I definitely would push you to try and use these services. They're free um, and it will really help you, your chances of stopping. If they continue to smoke, which is up to them at the end of the day, once you've done everything you can, you must warn them that the outcome of treatment is not going to be as good and it may reoccur as well, the, the period. 
Now, vaping is an interesting one. Um, vaping is getting more common. One in five of your smokers will vape, so you definitely need to ask it as part of your medical history. Um, when you do specialist training, you have to do like a dissertation thesis master's project thing, and I did mine on um, e-cigarettes. And so I've got, I spent like months in the library like researching e-cigarettes. It's, uh, um, it's fun, um, but I know quite a lot about it. So I'll just give you some background just for your interest. Um, there's three generations. One is kind of obsolete. Two is, you know, fairly common. Three is if you're super cool, you have third generation. Um, there's thousands and thousands of flavors, like you fancy like kiwi in the morning and chocolate in the afternoon and and no fudge in the, the evening. There's so many, there's, I think 7,000 unique flavors and there's over 466 brands. The reason why I'm telling you this is, this is why we don't know much about it. There are so many brands, so many different types doing good studies, as you all know, randomized control trials are your obviously your best level of study. Doing these randomized control trials is very, very difficult. And even if you do, you then can't extrapolate what you've learned from it to other e-cigarettes. So, we don't know much. What we do know, and this is a document I would advise you to read, is it's better for your general health. It does help smokers quit because it's the only thing that actually mimics the actual behavioral thing with the patches and chewing gum. You're not getting that behavioral thing. So it does help them quit, but the effects on perio um, are unknown. So what I would say to these patients is, okay, Mr. Smith, you're, good. you're trying to use this to stop smoking. That's okay, but we do really want you to stop vaping eventually as well. So again, vaping cessation should be on your treatment plan. Under the social, social history, one thing that you might not think of straight away is stress. And this seems to be particularly um, relevant now, post COVID, or it's not really post COVID yet, is it? Post lockdown and all that, when you go back to university, um, your patients are gonna be stressed. Um, they haven't been able to access care. Um, they've, some of them have lost their jobs. Um, stressful time for everyone. And stress has a huge impact on perio. Um, I see it all the time. Like I have patients who are stable for five, six years have been seeing them on clinic. And then suddenly, you know, I've done the pocket chart and suddenly they've everything relapses, but they're all, you know, hygiene's not that bad. I say to them, okay, what's going on? Um, and they'll say, oh, and I say, and I say to them, has anything changed in your life since I saw you? And then they'll say something, oh, I'm going through a divorce moving house there's always a negative life event so it's worth kind of having the conversation um, with your patient essentially the, the kind of mechanisms really is immune related but also um, if, you know if you're moving house and going through a divorce doing your incidental brushes first thing in the morning is not going to be your priority um, so it's a behavioral thing as well so that's social history now we go on to um, uh, dental history and this is where diet and nutrition comes into play and diet has a role for sure um, various kind of papers are on things like vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, magnesium, zinc. Um, they say like carbohydrate rich diet is not um, so good for perio, whereas a paleolithic diet is very good. So there's lots of research on it, but I, I wouldn't get too bogged down on that. I would just say as long as they're eating a good amount of fruit and veg, um, they're fine. So that does come into play. So we haven't even put the chair back yet. Remember, we've just done our complaining on, we've just done our history. Look how much we've taken just from that. So um, it's worth looking at all these things when you're talking to your patients and when you're understanding a patient before then looking in their mouth. Um, with regards to the examination, obviously your key thing is your um, uh, screening and your BPE. Now, one thing I must say to you guys is when you go out into practice, um, it's so easy um, to stop doing the BPE. Um, you might be like, oh my God, Rena, what are you talking about? Everyone does the BPE. Okay, they don't. Um, most dentists make up the BPE. They'll copy the BPE before you're like, oh my God, I would never do that. I know what you're thinking. Don't um, ever do that, but it's very easy to fall into that trap. It literally takes about one minute to do a BPE. And this is why dentists get sued, is because they don't pick up perio. And your BPE is your best way of screening patients. Um, you will know how to do a BPE, or so you use your simplified BPE from the age of seven. If your BP requires you and indicates you need a pocket chart, you need a pocket chart. With the pocket chart, obviously it's not just about probing depth, there's more to it. You've got your bleeding, you've got your suppuration, you've got recession, um, mobility and furcation involvement. We should record everything. Um, and probing depth, by the way, um, you probably don't know this, but it's, it's the right term to use. Pocket depth is, it's not, at, you're not actually measuring the actual pocket, the pocket depth is actually histologically what you would see, whereas a probing depth is what you probed. Um, I don't want to get too biological today if you want to 
um, send me an email to explain that to you. But basically, the right term to you is it's used as your probing depth or your parallel to the probing depth. So that's your examination. Okay, you've had a look in the mouth. You're then going to need to do some special investigations. And obviously, the first special investigation that you'd always do for your patients are radiographs. And in perio, um, obviously, you take your bite wings for your um, caries diagnostic uh, um, uh, matters. But for perio, your gold standard, as you know, is your parallel perio for radiographs. Now, one thing I would say is when you're reporting on your radiographs, don't just focus for perio on bone. There is a lot more for you to think about. It's not just the amount of bone loss, it's not just the pattern of bone loss, but also don't forget the anatomy, right? What are the roots like? Are they nice, long and tapered, or are they short and conical? Think about anchorage. If you've got nice, long, tapered roots, the prognosis of that tooth is much better than one with the tiny little conical roots, even if they've both got 50% bone loss. So look at, again, in the habit of looking at anatomy, look at the periapical status, look at any local factors. Are there any overhangs? Are there any open margins? Are there any um, other deficiencies? So don't just look at the bone. Um, per the, the actual bone, um, in terms of the radiographs, they don't get that um, old very quickly. Like caries, you've got to take every, depending on the risk, like six months, three months, whatever. Perio, you probably get away with a radiograph for a couple of years, actually, and nothing else has changed clinically. One thing that I was taught, um, this was more after I did my undergrad, um, read radiographs in the same direction every time. So um, here, right, if you start, you always start coronal to apical, or apical to coronal. And this is great because it stops you from missing things out. So here you start from the top. Okay, I can see that heavily restored six, um, you've got the restoration on the five, work your way down, then you could comment on the um, post you could comment on the endo, you work your way down, comment on the fact that you can see furcation or evidence of furcation involvement, work your way down, look at the radiolucency on that means you're rooted the six, work your way down, apically, um, you know, periapical error and distally there's a, um, a file sticking out. So if you read the radiograph in the same way, you don't need to comment on that that's relevant, you won't miss anything out. So it's quite a, just a general um, tip. The other thing in your special investigations will be sensibility testing. That's the right word to use, not vitality testing, because you're not technically testing your vitality. Sensibility testing using endofrost, electric pulp test is, is more accurate. Um, and you'd be doing this for your patients who might have perio endo, or I should call it endo perio now, which is a new classification, by the way, if you don't know, it's switched for some ridiculous reason. I have no idea why. It's not because endo is more important. You can tell Karina that next week, um, but it's, it's now called endoperio. Um, but anyway, for those types of lesions, for furcation involvement, um, grade two or three, I'd want to be doing that. Um, so that's your sensibility testing. Good. So we've done the um, complaining of, we've done the medical history, family history, social history, um, dental history. We've then had a look in the mouth. We've then, then done our special investigations, radiograph sensibility testing. Now we put everything together and we make a diagnosis. And annoyingly, uh, and you're probably thinking, oh my God, why did the new classification now come out and just about got the hang of this one. Now this whole new thing's come out. Um, it's not too bad, actually. Um, I'm going to really simplify it for you. So this um, table, uh, and by the way, it's good to know the background as to how this will happen. I don't want to go over time too much, but um, there was a group of European periodontists, a group of American periodontists. They all got together in America um, a year or so ago, and they decided the classification needs updating. It's been a while. Um, but what happened was they released this paper and everyone in the UK got really annoyed because it was actually quite difficult to implement. Um, so then a, a British group, basically a, a few of us, I think about 10 of us got together and then we simplified it. And that's the BSP version that you need to implement in UK practice. So there's almost kind of two versions, but this table remains the same. The one that the BSP simplified was this section here, um, which is the problem for diseases and conditions. Um, this is the paper if you want some, um, but you've already done so much reading because you're at home. Um, but if you want to read some more, this is the one to look at, which you've probably already seen anyway. So within that, what they did was they subcategorized um, periodontal diseases and classifications into periodontal health and gingival diseases, periodontitis, and other conditions affecting periodontium. This category, the periodontal health one, is actually a new one. And it's the first time that they've actually um, made a classification for health. And so it's good to know that. And all you kind of need to know is three millimeters and below is healthy and less than 10% bleeding on a patient by patient basis is healthy. The one I think you really need to get your head around is the periodontitis one, because you're going to be seeing that on a daily basis. And now, firstly, there are only three types of periodontitis 
I'm sure that those of you in your fourth and fifth year are probably so annoyed that you learned that huge table with all the types of parentheses. I mean, I remember memorizing it. Actually, I don't think I memorized it for undergrad. But either way, um, you don't need to know that anymore. It's, it's really simple. It's only three types, necrotizing, periodontitis, and periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. And um, I mean, periodontitis is just called periodontitis, so no chronic, uh, no aggressive. Now, you've probably seen like the BSP flowchart. I'm sure your tutors have shown you the new classification and gone through it. Um, I still think it's quite confusing if you, if you need to break it down even further. So I basically came up with these six steps, which might help you um, speed up the process on getting uh, to the diagnostic statement. So these are six steps I use. Let's just go through each one. The first step is actually asking yourself, is this periodontitis? Is this actually a periodontitis patient? And how you know that is by looking at the bone loss. Is there bone loss? Is the bone loss due to perio? Because sometimes bone loss isn't due to perio, right? If you do a crown, if you do crown lengthening, if you take out an impacted ape, you've got to draw bone around it, you're losing bone. It's not because of perio. So you need to look at these radiographs, so look at this patient on the left. Yes, this is due to perio. So if it is, all you have to do is add in a label saying periodontitis. That's it. You've got periodontitis, number one, done. Number two, what's the disease extent? Okay, is it localized, generalized, or molar incisor? And molar incisor is like a new thing they introduced. And you're looking at the bone loss here only. You're not looking at pockets, you're not looking at anything else, you're looking at bone loss. So here on the left, we can see the bone loss is everywhere. It's more definitely more than 30% of the teeth. So that is a generalized case. So, so far, you then switch over one and two, you've got generalized parasitis. Step three is your stage. And stage is all about severity. How bad is the bone loss? And for this, you've got to zoom in to the worst site. So here from this patient, we can see obviously the upper right thigh has a worse amount of bone loss. Okay, fine. You pick that tooth and you forget about the rest. Even if the rest have like 5% bone loss, it doesn't matter, you go for the one with 90% bone loss. And then what you do is you divide the tooth up into thirds. Stage one is like hardly any bone loss, but I would focus on stage two, three, four, coronal, mid, apical. Um, and depending obviously on this case, it's clearly stage four because it's in the apical third. So that's step three, which is stage. Then all you do is think about how susceptible your patient is. So stage is for severity, grade is for susceptibility. So, okay, my patient's got 90% bone loss, but how quickly did that happen? So then what you do is you ask yourself three very quick questions. Now you can do this little um, calculation, but I'm not very good at math. So I just ask myself, okay, is the bone loss more than my patient's age? You got a 20 year old with 50% bone loss, it's more than their age. They are susceptible. They're gonna be they're at this end of the, of the spectrum. They're grade C. If it's less than half their age, they're not that susceptible. You're a 20 year old with 5% bone loss. Okay, so now that they've got some bone loss, not, it's not that bad. They're gonna be grade A. Anything in between is grade B. And that's probably the quickest way to do it. So if our patient was 50 and she's got 90% bone loss, she's grade C. Then what you do is look at your pocket chart because so far you've only been staring at radiographs, which is, we don't treat bone loss, right? But we need to know it because they're a perio patient. So you're probably thinking, why did we really spend four steps out of six on looking at radiographs when you don't treat bone loss? Because the reason is, once you've lost bone because of perio, you are now a perio patient for life. And if you don't have that label against you, you won't have maintenance and it will relapse. So you need to be called a perio patient. A bit like diabetes. Once they're diabetic, most occasions they are diabetic, even if they're well controlled. But then you need to know what you're going to treat. So you look at your pocket chart here and you look at the pockets, you look at the bleeding and you class your patients as either stable in disease remission or unstable. And the key distinguishing factor between remission and unstable is that in disease remission, you have more than 10% bleeding, but you do not have any deep pockets or open pockets. By the way, that's a really nice term to use for your patients, open and closed pockets. Open is anything you need to treat, so forward bleeding and above, um, and close is anything you, that you need treating, so forward without bleeding after treatment or three and below. So unstable is when you have even just one open pocket, that technically is an unstable patient. So our patient here is obviously unstable. And then the final step is you just tag on um, the two biggest risk factors. So diabetes and smoking, you tag them onto your statement, even if they're a previous smoker, you tag that on. It doesn't mean to say that all the other risk factors we went through aren't important. They are. And you might even want to make a new line and say other risk factors include da, da, da. But in your diagnostic statement, which is the right term to use, you only put down either smoking or diabetes. So this would be the case for our one.
Um, so I'll just run through that um, uh, again. So it's, a 40, it's the same patient, 49 year old, medically fit and well, 10 cigarettes a day for 10 years, history of periodontal treatment. These are the, this was the pocket chart, pockets everywhere basically. This was a full mouth PA. So quickly, number one, we'll say to ourselves, is this a perio patient? Yes, right, so it's periodontitis. Number two, is the bone loss generalized or localized? Generalized. Number three, which is the worst tooth? Upper right five. Is the bone loss in the coronal middle apical third? It's in the apical third, so that's stage four. Okay, the, the patient's 49, the bone loss is more than their age, so they're grade C, that's a fourth step. Five, look at the pocket chart, they're currently unstable, clearly. Do they have any risk factors? Yes, they were. They're, they are a smoker. So that's kind of like the quickest um, way of doing it. So I would um, sort of um, practice that. Um, uh, I've got lots of more cases. On my Instagram, there's loads of videos on this. I don't want to spend the whole presentation on um, diagnosis, but um, that should really help. Spend some time on those six steps. After diagnosis, you do need to talk about prognosis. And it should be your next automatic step, even for restorative cases, you know, endo, anything. Prognosis is really important, not for you, not just for you for planning your cases, but to communicate with your patients that if they have a guarded prognosis tooth, they might lose that tooth. Now, another thing dentists get sued for is they don't tell their patient they're going to lose the tooth at some point. They lose the tooth, they come back um, and say to the dentist, well, you didn't tell me this. Why didn't you refer me? And why haven't you told me about this? You're now going to pay for my implant. Um, it, patients can be really mean, so um, you've got to be prepared um, to make sure you do everything correctly. So adding in a statement about prognosis and the way I divide it up is good, fair, guarded, hopeless. Um, even if it's a general statement like all the molars have guarded prognoses, it's important. Then what you, do, what you do once you've got your diagnosis is you actually need to have a conversation with your patient and talk about what you found. The biggest mistake I made, um, I would say at university, I didn't quite, even in post-grad, I just used to get so excited about the clinical stuff. Like I used to say to my patient, um, even my first year of my perio training, I used to be like, oh my God, Mrs. Smith, we can get your like nine millimeter pocket down to like five millimeters or four millimeters. Um, and I was like really excited about it. And the patient would just look at me like, oh my God, you total weirdo. Like, I don't care about what you're talking about pockets and millimeters. Then I realized is you have to translate what you find to your patient to what they value. So then I started saying things like, you know what, Mr. Smith, if we can do this treatment, we're going to make sure we keep your teeth for longer, ideally for life. We're going to make sure you don't need to wear dentures. You're not going to have that you know, horrible, bad um, breath and taste that your wife keeps complaining about, yet you're not going to have that. You're not going to have wake up with blood on your pillow. Then they're suddenly motivated. Then they suddenly care about actually trying to get this under control. So, you know, translate what you find um, into what is valued by them. Even if you don't care about it, they do. Very, very briefly, by the way, whilst you're on examination diagnosis, implants, hopefully um, you are taught, I wasn't taught hardly anything about implants when I was an undergraduate. Hopefully it's a good part of the curriculum now. But treat implant patients like perio patients. Look at their oral hygiene, look at the colour and you know, the texture of the tissues. Look, always probe gently. Um, you can use a metal probe. Look out for bleeding, look out for any suppuration. You need a radiograph to see where the bone level is. Um, when you go out into practice, don't get scared of implants. You've got to assess them. If there's a problem, you don't have to treat it. You just have to let the patient know you have a problem. Even in your notes, if you just write peri-implant disease and you haven't managed to work out if it's peri-implant mucositis or peri-implantitis, um, you've got to make a note of it. Okay, great. We're now moving on to the treatment planning section. So we've done our diagnosis. We're now making a treatment plan. Now, um, I don't know if there's anyone from King's here, but I did my... I have no bias towards the London schools because I, I, did, I was of both of them, but... Um, I did my perio training at, at Guy's and you said you saw the shard going up. It's really interesting. I was reading about it and they said when they planned this project, they only made 13 changes, which is like nothing for such a big building project. And the reason why is because they spent 60% of the time planning and only 10% of the time executing. We normally do it the other way around. We normally spend, you know, like five um, minutes planning and then hours and hours doing the treatment because we, that's what excites us. But for perio patients, you must, must, must spend more time planning, thinking about tooth by tooth prognosis, thinking about, okay, if he's gonna lose those two teeth, how am I gonna replace them in the midterm, the long term? What do I need to speak to my patients about? Do I need to phase this treatment? Do I need to first start off with focusing on oral hygiene and then move on to active treatment? So it, it, it requires a little bit more thought. Also, interestingly, back to the shard, um, 
when I saw the, um, sh uh, when I last checked, um, the shard was still half empty. And the reason why is apparently, there's, they're saying this in the article, that they kind of built it on the wrong side of the river. It should have been on the other side where things are booming. So the other thing to take into account when you're doing treatment planning is take a step back. Look at your whole patient. Don't just focus on their pockets and their mouth. What are they like as an individual? What kind of other things do they have going on? For example, if they're a working mum with like five children, doing their TP regime first thing in the morning is not going to be their priority. Maybe you need to speak to them and say, look, Sarah, I know you're really busy. You've got four children. You know what? Drop them off to school. When you, when you come home, you've got 10 minutes to yourself. Do the interdental brush regime then. I don't mind as long as you do it once a day. If you hadn't said that, she probably wouldn't have done it at all. So get to know your patients. Okay, good. Now we're moving on to the actual treatment. So obviously the first thing you're going to do is OHI, number one OHI. And a couple of things, the 10 kind of little things to remember about this. You must, must, must orientate your patient before you jump into talking about modified bath and circular motion, all these kind of things. They don't, you'll be surprised at how little they understand, which is fair enough, right? We're taking it for granted, we know about everything, but you know, if you're going to have like a knee operation, your surgeon was trying to explain all the parts of the knee and this and that, you'd be like, yeah, I don't really get that. So orientate them, get a mirror, pull the lower lip back, get your probe, put it into the gingival sulcus and actually say, look, this is the tooth, this is the gum, this little bit where you see the probe going in, that's the pocket. That's where all the bacteria and bugs are getting trapped there. And we need to clean those areas. That's why you need to angle your toothbrush in this direction, um, 45 degrees. Show them the radiographs, show them the build up, and just say, look, this is all the bugs. I like using the word bug, they absolutely like, you should see their face, it's like, oh my God, I wanna get rid of this. So there's all these, and you can use emotive language to you know, motivate your patients. There's bugs, they're releasing toxins um, and they're eating away your bone. Um, you can see all the buildup there, that's the bacteria. Um, and then you say to them, look, you know, if you just use floss here, it would go straight down and straight up. Well, I, what you need to do is use that nice, big, um, gray interdental brush, which is thoroughly gonna clean the sides of the teeth. And then they'll say, well, actually doc, I don't really want to use that because you're gonna get gaps in my teeth. Then you say to them, actually, you've already got the gaps, you can see the bone's gone. It's just your gums are so swollen at the moment we can't see those gaps. So, you know, you try using um, all these kind of tools and orientate your patient. Disclose them if you can. I think they, they like the fact that you can give them an objective part score. Um, show them in the mouth. I don't know how it works at university, actually. You've got, you've got, you guys have got the test drive. Um, but uh, definitely show that the feel factor is important, um, both for electric brush and incidental brushes. Um, Always uh, promote interdental brushes more so than floss, as you know, they're more effective. Use videos to um, uh, show them the right angulation. We've got some um, videos on our YouTube. Uh, these are my teeth, so I can get yellow in my, yeah, I don't have perio, but I can get yellow in there. Um, but yeah, it's just good visual aid to show them. Um, we've got them on our YouTube, you can use them if you like, um, single tufted. Um, you know, all of these things, it helps them to remind them once they've come away from your appointment. I think I've got caries on my six. I'm too scared to have a restoration. I haven't got any restorations yet, so, but I'm pretty sure it's arrested. Um, fingers crossed anyway, probably not after lockdown. Um, the other things, uh, GPS. Um, so when you're doing um, OHI, you have to set some goals. GPS is an evidence-based way of changing behavior. So goal setting, planning, self-monitoring. Um, it's part of the EFP toolkit that I definitely include in your case studies and so on. So goal, you know, I want your part to be 40% by next time. Planning, you're, only, you're going to do this by focusing on your brushing. Self-monitoring, going to give them disclosing time to actually go away and try and explain to them that the purpley pinky stuff every week should get less and less. Um, keep it simple, reinforce it every single time. Give them the responsibility. Um, tell them it's 80% about what you do and 20% about what I do. Um, it's really important patients take on, uh, for especially for perio, it's, it's a large part of their um, home care, which is, is really, really important. In terms of treatment, so we're talking about RSD here or RSI, root surface debridement. Uh, debridement is the right word to use, as you know, planing and sc even scaling is a little bit kind of old school. You want to use root surface debridement or super gingival debridement, sub gingival debridement, root surface debridement. Um, uh, but your indications, you want to motivate a patient, it's the pockets of five millimeters or more, or four millimeters of bleeding. Um, there's no evidence of one technique's better than the other. Um, so if you want to do full mouth and you go out to practice, you know, you might logistically, you'll have to work with the patient, whether you do full mouth, quadrant by quadrant, half mouth. Um, I have to say quadrant by quadrant, it's not very popular in practice, but it might be in, in hospital. But it doesn't really matter. It was what works for you and the patient. 
Um, healing is pretty incredible. This is actually from Ian Chappell, who's one of my favorite paranormalists from Birmingham. Um, he sent me this a little while ago, and I started taking, you shouldn't read really grass, by the way, uh, for no reason, but I think this was some research that he was doing. And you can see just by non-surgical perio treatment, look, he's actually got some bony infill. It's amazing. Um, so the power of perio, you know, most people would have extracted that tooth. So give the teeth a chance, um, you'd be surprised as sometimes how well they do, even with non-surgical. Um, ultrasonics, in practice, you end up using mainly ultrasonics. Um, it's good to use a try to try to use both hand scalers and ultrasonics, but you'll find in practice um, you'll end up using ultrasonics because they're easier and quicker to use. Obviously, now um, a lot of people aren't using them because of the AGPs, but um, you know it's it's a popular one. Um, you pick the most appropriate tip, try and invest in equipment when you graduate, even if your principal doesn't buy it for you. I bought just a few instruments that I, I bought myself and then they're yours. It's worth um, doing that to, to achieve good quality treatment. When you're using your ultrasonic, remember it's different to when you're using hand scalers. Hand scalers, you're going apical first and then you scale up. Um, whereas for um, ultrasonics, you start from coronal to apical, it's the other way around. Um, and um, Jane has just sent me a question. Um, this is actually, I should have said that because I had some like students debating this with me uh, or each other and then asking me, what's the difference between RSD and subgingival scaling? Um, they're, they're, I would say the same thing. Um, so there's only, there's three terms I use, supragingival debridement, root surface debridement, and then something else that I call a maintenance debridement, which is just like when you're keeping them on maintenance. So for you, I would say supragingival debridement, um, root surface debridement. Subgingival scaling is pretty much equivalent. Now, I know some people say, well, if you're going into the pocket, that's technically subgingival. As a periodontist, I would just use those two terms. And if you're actually into a pocket, like four millimeters of bleeding or five millimeters and above, I would call that root surface debridement. If you're just doing a super scale, like with three millimeter pockets, of course you're going in the pocket. I would still class that as a, what I call supergingival debridement. Um, that's kind of to keep it simple, essentially. Um, yeah, so with ultrasonics, just make sure they're not worn down. Um, you can get wear guides for this, light grass, because you lose a tactile sensation with this compared to hand scalers. Um, and um, yeah, invest again in good instruments. Antibiotics are sometimes used. I use them quite a lot, but my cases are really severe. Um, but overall, I would say they're very, very limited to patients where we used to call them aggressive perio or patients where you're not getting that outcome and there's no you know, risk factors, like there's not tons of plaque. They're a non-smoker, um, so there's something else going on. Local antibiotics, there's not much evidence for that, to be honest. Uh, things like perio chip, um, all of that. You've got to be, when you go out into practice as well, you've got to be very clued on because these companies will come and try and sell you anything and everything. And you've got to use what you've learned at university and the evidence base way of analyzing things to think, actually, does it actually work? So perio chip is a classic example. Now, with their studies, their increase or improvement is clinic is cl uh, sorry statistically significant right by like 0 0.4 whatever it is but clinically is that significant you have to ask yourself okay it's statistically significant but is it clinically significant if it's not clinically significant then why do it you might as well refer that to as parallel and do a small surgery so just be um careful about those things with implants whilst we're on treatment very briefly if it's healthy reinforce oral hygiene which can be quite tricky um, because with implants, you have this really bulbous structure. So you've got to kind of tuck the single tufted underneath the, what we call emergence profile. Um, if they've got peri-implant uh, mucositis, uh, mucositis, just reinforce oral hygiene. These plastic scalers are a waste of time. Again, reps try and sell you them. Um, you don't need them, just need normal uh, ultrasonic tip is fine. Um, if they've got peri-implantitis, you're probably going to refer that patient. They're going to need surgery. Um, and bone loss around implants is super quick compared to bone loss around um, uh, uh, teeth. You know, that patient can go from nothing to, a, to an implant in their hand within months. Um, remember with implants, there's no grade one mobility, there's no grade two, grade three, it's either in there or not. It's either osseointegrated integrated or not. So just be very careful. So, good, um, we are uh, nearly there. Okay, so once your patient has had treatment, then you need to hopefully, once they're healthy, Put them on a supportive periotherapy program and supportive periotherapy is the right word to use or the updated term rather than maintenance i still quite like maintenance um i'm sure you'd be fine you'll get penalized in your exam if you use maintenance but it's 
you know, it's support, supposed to be supportive family therapy, which is important and integral for all of our patients. It needs to be on your treatment plan right from the beginning. So you've got to put like number six, SPT on a three monthly basis. And three monthly is default um, for most patients. Um, but you may want to tailor that, right? So if your patient um, is um, really well controlled, they're really good with the oral hygiene, you might make it four months. If they're very poorly controlled diabetic, um, they smoke, um, they're not interested in the oral hygiene, you might make it two months. So you tailor it and you keep adjusting it. There will be occasions um, where you can't get the diphtheria under control yourself and you may then need to refer for specialist treatment. And there are guidelines for this. Um, the BSP have created some guidelines that general dentists use in practice, as well as just being aware of them. Um, and it said that many of the kind of complex, um, but not that complex, because this is the reason why dentists get sued. They don't realize that anyone with a BP score of four in any section plus an additional risk factor requires a referral. Quite a lot of patients qualify for a referral. It's much easier for a patient to allege after the event, which is normally tooth loss, that they would have preferred a referral. So minimize delay, always get a second opinion if you're not sure or anything, even if they just come back with a treatment plan. So just to finish, there are three groups of patients that um, in the specialist practice that we treat. Um, the first category is your periodontitis category. And you know what we used to call aggressive, patients got pretty good OH, but they're not responding to normal treatment. Residual pockets, often vertical defects, uh, also gingival overgrowth. Generally, we see these types of patients. Um, like this patient, what we used to call generalized aggressive, deep pockets everywhere, um, quite a lot of bonus for her age, she's only 32. Um, look at that upper left too, um, so it's pretty severe. Um, and uh, so what we did was some OHI, extracted that to lower I8, did some non-surgical with adjunctive antibiotics, did some pocket reduction surgery, and now she's on mace. So just because it's like genetic, it doesn't mean it doesn't respond well, it actually responds just as well. Um, and you can get these stable, the patients have been stable for five, six years now. Um, and you can get some really nice results. So that's your typical periodontitis patient. In terms of surgery for pockets, you either treat surgery with a receptive approach, i.e. you cut away the pocket, or you try and regenerate it. So here we're cutting away the pocket. We literally, um, sorry, we do something called a distal wedge, which you um, cut away the gum, stitch it back together, and you've literally got rid of that bulky tissue. Sometimes you also smooth out the bone as well. Or you try and regenerate where um, uh, you essentially pull the gum back and you get like a bony defect and you fill that up with bone. I don't know if you guys are following my clinic, uh, it's just at RW Pair on Instagram. I just probably uh, expired now, but I put on a story yesterday where we lifted up a, a flap on the upper canine and we had a really nice defect and we filled it up with bone. It's optimal if you can try and regenerate rather than um, recept. Gingival overgrowth, right? You're not gonna do surgery straight away on that. You need to get the inflammation down then you do surgery um, uh, and get rid of all the bulbous areas. So that's your kind of periodontitis category. You also, which is often forgotten about, which is absolutely huge now, is recession. So I see lots of patients down in the clinic with um, severe recession, either due to overzealous brushing, um, post-ortho, um, things like this. So this picture on the left, this is really bad news, not just because of the amount of recession, but the quality of the gingery. The ginger bean is unattached, it's non carotenized it's very fragile. So this patient, they're not purposely missing cleaning that area. It's actually just really sore for them to clean it. So they don't clean it very well, they get more plug. Because the gum is so thin and fragile, um, it rece recedes even more and then it keeps going and, and they're gonna end up losing that tooth. So we do something called a free gingival graft, where we take a little piece from the palate and essentially stitch it on um, and it thickens the tissue, it's tough gum which means it doesn't hurt when they brush it. They can keep it clean. It's really resistant. Even if they do get a bit of plot there, it's not gonna recede. And then they're sorted for life and it's nice and thick. Um, these are some other examples. I'll probably do this like once a week. Um, the free gingival graft is such a common, very predictable surgery. Um, the other one that we do on the upper arch, especially the coronally advanced flap, where you're pulling the gum down um, and putting a little graft underneath. That can make such a big difference um, to people's smile. So, this is why perio is fun and exciting, guys. Um, this is why I like it. You get to do some really cool stuff with surgery. Um, you can really, really make a big difference. Um, it's really fun. Um, crown lengthening is your final group, um, who is kind of the opposite of the recession, but it's what periodontists do. Restorative or aesthetic crown lengthening. Um, like restorative, you know, you've got a broken down tooth, you want to try and lengthen it. So you can reestablish your biologic width and put a crown on it, make a tooth restorable. 
or you know gummy smiles we just literally did a gingivectomy here um this case was just one tooth that was affected um makes such a big difference here i worked with one of the dentists who did um uh i, I did the crown lengthening or they now the patients call it a gum lift um to make it sound cool um so we did a gum lift and then we did um the dentist's composite veneers uh, she was an actor actually and she kept getting picked on when the analysis uh, smile was very nice so she decided to to do that um on my recent grid i just on my instagram i posted a video um so i tried to video some of the stuff i do now i posted a quick one minute video of a crown lengthening case five to five um it's quite fun to watch that all right um so um just to uh oh, let me just see a couple of questions which are on the chat um so in terms of um there's a question on aggressive perio and what that is now classified as um so it's not called aggressive anymore you base it on the patient's susceptibility i.e their grade um and their severity so what it probably would equate to it doesn't quite work it doesn't equate but i would say a grade definitely a grade c um stage four um in a you know young individual good oh that would be your typical or molar incisor as well would be your localized aggressive typical case um and then Alice was asking about the success rate of the procedure. All the procedures that I've shown you in the surgery are really successful. Um, they last if, if you make sure you've got to um, tackle the etiological factors first. Um, and like, for example, recession, right? If they're over brushing and you haven't corrected that and then you do the surgery, of course, it's going to come back. So you've got to correct that first. The crown lengthening um, uh, tends to stay there. Um, it doesn't increase sensitivity because, without getting too technical, the gummy smiles are usually a condition, you can look this up, it's called altered passive eruption. Altered passive eruption, where the gum, the CEJ is all the way up there, we're just taking away the gum to where it should be. So it's actually the crown or the enamel that you're seeing, um, not the root. And if it is a root and you're lengthening it, then you need to do composite oil crown. Um, and with um, free gingival graft and the recession surgery, you don't get a pocket, it's a common question. You don't get a pocket, you actually get a regeneration. So you get a shallow pocket, it's very, very clever. Um, so you don't end up with um, a, a pocket. Um, so just to conclude before we, if we have time for further questions, um, you guys might want to sign up. Uh, I've got a Perio email series. Um, you may want to, oh, sorry, I don't know why my title didn't come up. Um, but if you type into um, your, your, your browser, bit. Oh, sugar, forgotten it. I think it's bit.ly forward slash perio school email. The P, S, and E has to be in capitals. Sorry, I've got it. I don't know why it's not showing on my slide, but uh, bit.ly forward slash perio school email. Um, if you're bored, you will, it might be quite nice for you just to save these emails of September. Um, but I'm uh, over lockdown, I decided to do quite a lot of online education, so I've created an email series. You'll get one email from me every single day um, on Perio. There's various series and um, you might find it, as a student especially, you might find it quite interesting. The other thing that I've done over lockdown um, and much before is created what I call Perio School, which is so exciting. Uh, I've wanted to do this for so long and it's online courses for dental students, hygienists and dentists. Um, and I'm going to quickly show you a video. It will be great for you guys to be a part of it. Um, I've done a really special student discount, which I'll tell you about. Um, uh, so I'm going to put the URL in this chat for the Perry School email, bit dot, bit dot ly forward slash Perry School. Is that right now? Yeah, yeah. that's for the uh, emails. But anyway, I know this at the video, it says, are you a dentist or hygienist? But it is relevant to dental students. If you want to be like, if you want to know everything you need to know about Perio and just nail the subject, um, literally there's seven modules. I will teach you everything. There's like 15 lessons per module. There's quizzes, there's a forum, there's resources. It's basically a revision gold mine. Um, I would would I would have loved this as an undergraduate for myself. Um, I just think sometimes it's so boring. It's taught in such a dull way, but I wanted to change that. Um, we've done a student discount. There is, it's ridiculous, it's 75% off. Um, and um, so it come, it's 199 pounds, which I know for you might, as a student, might think, oh my God, it's a lot of money, but trust me, if you can just use it for your revision, um, you won't, investing in your education, you will never regret, trust me. 
Um, so um, I really hope that's accessible for you guys. The dentists are paying like the normal price of seven ninety and uh, nine ninety. So I just wanted to make it accessible. Um, uh, I, I wish I could give it to you for free, um, but also paying something for something it makes it, it makes it take you seriously, and you will kind of want to learn and, and go about doing it. The official launch is on um, Sassy. I just want to show you this video, um, and then I will conclude. If you're probably a dentist or hygienist, do you want to learn more about perio? You might find it as exciting as I do. I know, I'm a bit of a geek. But seriously, there's more in it for you than you might think. Learn more and more. Become a dentist with substance. Become a respected hygienist. Say hello to Perio School and our two new courses. This one's for the dentists and this one's for all you hygienists and therapists. So, what's on the menu? Diagnosis, knee cancellation, air flow, treatment planning, period treatment, communication, managing complaints, requiring guidelines, time lengthening, and much more. Oh, and if you love pizza, pig's head, and a bit of crown lengthening, we have a hands on day in London. And don't worry, hygienists, we've got you covered too. Guys, don't waste this opportunity. Invest in your career and join the dental revolution. So, um, yeah, I think you'll really like it. I think by, uh, we've had a few students test it out um, and they've really enjoyed it. Um, but it'll be good to, to, for, for you guys to um, you test it out. Um, all the, 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 uh, we've done a huge charity component and basically because of the, the situation at the moment, um, each uh, sign up will basically feed a family of four for four weeks um, in India or Pakistan, um, which is really nice. So, you know, your money's going to something worthwhile. That's the student discount code. Um, you can find all the information um, uh, online anyway. So um, just to say thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been great speaking to all of you guys. I can't believe there's so many people still here. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to help at any time. Um,